Hello everyone, you're tuning into another episode of Anime Spotlight, where we put the spotlight on shows that you may not have heard of, or shine the light a little brighter on shows that you're already familiar with. Today we'll be taking a look at the early 2000s gothic shonen, D. Grey Man. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the 8th episode of Anime Spotlight. For those of you who haven't seen the series, or who've seen it but need a quick reminder of what it's all about, allow me to provide you with a quick synopsis, courtesy of my anime list. Losing a loved one is so painful that one may sometimes wish to resurrect them, a weakness that the enigmatic Millennium Earl exploits. To make his mechanical weapons known as Akuma, he uses the souls of the dead that are called back. Once a soul is placed in an Akuma, it is trapped forever, and the only way to save them is to exercise them from their vessel using the anti-Akuma weapon, Innocence. After spending three years as a disciple of General Cross, Alan Walker is sent back to the Black Order, an organization comprised of those willing to fight Akuma and the Millennium Earl, to become an official exorcist. With his arm as his innocence and a cursed eye that can see the suffering souls within an Akuma, it is up to Alan and his fellow exorcists to stop the Millennium Earl's ultimate plot one that can lead to the destruction of the world. Okay, with that out of the way, let's rewind back to where this all began. On April 21st, 1980, Katsura Hoshino was born in Japan Shiga Prefecture. She had an older sister, her fraternal twin, and a younger brother. While she dreamed of becoming an astronaut when she was little, she wasn't very interested in school. But she did enjoy reading manga, and would read copies of Dragon Quest The Adventure of Dai that her brother liked to collect, as well as various titles written by Fuyumi Soryo and Makamura Satoru when her mother would buy them. She was also fond of Arabian Majin Bakenten Lamp Lamp, which is written by Susumu Sendo and illustrated by Takashi Obata. But while she liked reading manga, she preferred watching anime. She had a fondness for Studio Ghibli films, re-watching her favorite Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind several times. Studio Ghibli and Hayao Miyazaki were large inspirations for her. She even wanted to become an animator after watching Castle in the Sky. Katsura Hoshino picked up drawing in high school, inspired by Nakaoka Takeuchi's manga Sailor Moon. Her interest in school didn't appear to grow with age, as she would use every excuse that she could think of to get out of class. And even when she would attend, there was a decent chance that she would be drawing in the middle of them. At the age of 17, she started to apply for work as an animator without her parents' approval. While she wasn't successful initially, the next year she got a job as an animator in Tokyo. Even though she had finally gotten the job that she wanted, things did not go smoothly. She even considered moving back in with her parents due to financial issues. However, after some encouragement from her sister, she decided to move to Kyoto for better opportunities. While she did find work, she wasn't able to perform up to an acceptable level. At some point during this transition, her mother encouraged her to start writing manga. But it doesn't look like Hoshino had a lot of free time. She still struggled with her new job, and the long hours of work and commuting on the bullet train took its toll on her. But despite her struggles, she managed and was able to perform well. As time passed, she became less and less sure of what she wanted to do professionally. At the age of 21, after urging from her sister and a work friend, she scheduled a meeting with Shuisha, the Japanese publishing company. The anxiety of the upcoming meeting nearly caused her to miss it, after not being able to sleep for three days in a row. Despite her doubts, she did end up making her appointment, although she was late and wearing her pajamas. Fortunately for her, the editor that she spoke with thought that she might just have the talent to be successful, and that's when her career as a mangaka began. The draft that she submitted to the editorial department of Shonen Jump was actually the first version of D. Grayman, and after they decided to work with her, the editorial team assigned Hoshino over as editor, Tishi. Unfortunately, Tishi only ended up working with Hoshino for about two months. Because of this, and the fact that she still lived in Kyoto at the time, she did work with Tishi on the draft, but they only discussed it a few times. This was far from a comfortable situation for Hoshino, and she still wasn't sure if she should commit to being a mangaka. This decision was made even more difficult because she was introduced to a video game company that was looking for an animator. Hoshino discussed this life-changing decision in an interview with their editors in the D. Gray Man fan book, Great Arc. So at that point in time, I was forced with a critical decision of either getting a stable job or to become a mangaka where I faced a risky career and made need to take a side job to make ends meet. After discussing with Tishi, the Tishi, who was usually very warm and caring, said to me very sternly, Please continue to draw manga. Afterwards, I made up my mind to reject the offer from the video game company. But after that, I got a call saying that Tishi is going to transfer out of the editorial department, and Hoshino's editor will be Waishi. Because of her respect for Tishi and her inexperience, she was worried that she wouldn't get along with Waishi, and that her career as a mangaka would end before it began. Waishi, on the other hand, was looking forward to working with her. He and Tishi were hired at around the same time, and he had heard that she was talented. And after taking a look at her draft, he agreed. Shortly afterwards, she got a part-time job and moved back to Tokyo. Once there, she met Waishi and they began working on her first project. While it ended up working out, it certainly didn't go the way that she envisioned it. When I first discussed the draft with Waishi, my main work was working on the original draft of the second short story, Continue, a story about zombies. And the prototype for an exorcist story, Zone, was just supposed to be a filler for the zombie story. I only drew it for a change of pace, I never had any intention to submit it. When Waishi told me bring the drafts, I was suddenly driven by this threatening thought, if I don't bring a lot over, I'll be killed. So to make it look as if I was carrying a thick stack of manuscripts, I brought it along. As a result, Zone's prototype draft was the one that led Waishi to say with feeling, this is the one. As the previous quote suggested, Hoshino actually wanted to create a story about zombies, 
not exorcists. I actually wanted to draw zombies. And then later, in order to decide if we wanted to draw a zombie story or an exorcist story, we debated for quite a while, but we still decided to go with the exorcist story. Well, since it'll probably just end in one chapter, I drew it in a very relaxed manner. I was just going by the feeling that after I'm done with this, I can draw the zombie story. So I drew the draft for Zone very seriously. Even though she tried her best, she was still very inexperienced and had to learn how to operate in a professional environment. While at the time, manga was drawn with drip pens, pens that require you to dip them in ink before drawing. But Hoshino was only accustomed to drawing with ballpoint pens because Tishi only saw the drafts and I never gave him my manuscripts. So when I submitted them, I didn't know what was the proper way to draw manga. I used ballpoint pens, I didn't use screen tone, and none of them were complete works. So everything about a proper production of a manuscript was a first for me. She and Yashi spent a lot of extra time working on Zone because she had to learn the right way to do things on the fly. And that's not the only thing she had to do on the job. You'd think that someone who wrote stories about zombies and exorcists would be interested in the supernatural, but Hoshino was not. Actually, she doesn't like scary things at all. But in order to gather reference material for her drawing, she forced herself to watch a few horror movies, like The Exorcist. Despite the terror that they inflicted on her, they served as a valuable point of reference for her design of the Akuma. The other major influence on her design of Akuma was based on her fondness for sci-fi. While she was still working with Tishi, they would draw sci-fi stories. Because of this, drawing the Akuma as machines was easy. But because of watching these movies, I got my concept design. In conclusion, the design of the demons would be better if they were a little gross. So from this, I got the thought that if machinery sounds were produced from a human body, it would be pretty gross, wouldn't it? Or thoughts that machines could also be biological beings. In December of 2002, Hoshino made her publishing debut with the one-shot manga Zone, and Chuisha's Akamaru Jump. Zone had a very interesting premise. Three years ago, a girl named Julia died in a shipwreck. Now, her brother Robin had a meeting with the Millennium Earl. The Earl promised to bring Julia back to life, and he did, just not in the way that Robin was expecting. Instead of resurrecting Julia, body and soul, the Millennium Earl simply traded Robin's soul for Julia's. Now newly revived, Julia discovered that not only was she alive, but she now inhabited the body of her now deceased brother. And if that wasn't enough, she also had to come to grips with the fact that now she was no longer human, she was something else entirely, an Akuma. Julia eventually bumped into an exorcist named Cross, who took her as his apprentice after giving her his dark, scarred left arm to use as an Akuma weapon. After some time had passed, Cross had taken on a mission in Japan, but he left his sword, Abaddon, behind. Julia now had a mission of her own, to bring Abaddon back to Cross. Zone was received well by Akamara Jump's readers, coming in third place in a reader-voted poll. In July 2003, Hoshino would release her second one-shot, Continue, in Weekly Shonen Jump. Continue starred a 13-year-old boy named Tayo Yamamoto. Tayo Yamamoto was obsessed with being a hero. This obsession would drive him to do crazy things, like bungee jumping from the roof of his school. One day, after finding out that one of his friends had been kidnapped, he got into a fight with the kids who were responsible. Afterwards, he noticed that the color of the moon had turned into a mysterious shade of red. And then the unthinkable happens. Zombies start appearing in the red moonlit night. While he tried his best to fight them off, he was eventually killed by the zombies. He thought that his life was over until he heard a mysterious voice in his head. That voice belonged to someone named Shiropen, who turned him into a zombie in order to revive him. After defeating the zombies, Tayo Yamamoto made an interesting discovery. The one behind these zombie appearances is a being known as the Millennium Earl. Unfortunately for Hoshino, Continue wasn't received very well. However, because of Continue's relatively poor reception, she was encouraged to go back to Zone and use that as a base for her next project. Even still, she didn't want to give up on it. She really wanted to draw zombies and was sure to let her editor know about it. But the protest from Waishi, who actually asked her to start drawing D. Greyman again, eventually won out and she started working on D. Greyman. As you may have noticed, both Zone and Continue have a lot of things in common. Several elements in these works were inspired by or taken directly from the other, and her next work was no exception. The one constant between all of her stories is one particular character, the Millennium Earl. This is because he was actually the character that Hoshino was the most interested in writing about. In an interview with Hajihara in Greylog, she states, I'd wanted to draw a manga that had the Millennium Earl character since my newbie days. Even I don't understand why, but I thought about him all the time back then. That's why he appeared in all of my works, regardless of the kind of story. He was in my unseen storyboards, in my debut work Zone, and in Continue. As I drew those, the Earl's character gradually grew more solid. I then planned a story that had the Earl at his core, and that was how D. Greyman was born. I first planned to make him the protagonist of that, but then I realized that an old man like the Earl wouldn't work as a main character in a shonen magazine. So the Earl became the protagonist behind the scenes and I created a new protagonist from scratch, Alan Walker. You could say that Alan was born for the Earl's sake. Alan Walker was largely based on Robin and Julia from Zone. His appearance closely resembles Robin and his personality and abilities as an exorcist were based on the ones that Julia possessed. But that wasn't always the plan. I conceived Alan as an Akuma first, a girl wearing a boy's skin. The idea was to have a protagonist that was a boy on the outside but a girl on the inside, but my editor argued that readers would react differently to Alan's tears, being a girl, even if the outward appearance was that of a boy's. Women cry easily, so their tears won't move anyone's heart, he said rashly. I was against it by reflex back then, but with time I realized how difficult it is to have a female protagonist in a shonen magazine, so I changed it to a boy. The design concept for the character was simple. According to Hoshino, he must be 
the person most suitable for the uniform, but she had a hard time conveying that through his character. Actually, the original design was supposed to be an energetic youth with messy flyaway hair and other things like that. But when the character was actually drawn out in the uniform, there was a sense of a lack of coordination. So what suited him better was his more mature design. However, since he is an exorcist, I wanted to create a very scary image. Therefore, I drew this bloody wound on his face. Compared to Robin from that time, he's a different kind of boy. In order to see his expressions properly, I gave him a center parting hairstyle. Unlike Alan Walker, who was based on an already existing character, Lin Lee was copied directly from Zone. While her appearance and personality were similar, her background was changed. In Zone, she wasn't a member of the Black Order. She actually worked a regular job in a manju shop. While there are some obvious similarities between Zone and D. Gray Man, there are several differences, with many of them revolving around Akuma and the Millennium Earl. Here are some of the general differences. The creation of Akuma, the design of Akuma, the process of stopping the creation of Akuma, how Akuma take over their hosts, the Earl's Akuma creation ritual, the Earl's territory and sphere of influence, and the location of the Black Order. Even with all the similarities between her previous works and what would become D. Gray Man, there was still a lot of work to be done. Katsura Hoshino still had several characters to write in order to flesh out the world. Her process for creating new characters is extensive, and most of the work will never be printed. I first imagined their lives, even the parts that most likely won't ever appear in the manga. What kind of parents they had, how they were raised, their death. I mainly determined the major events of their lives before anything else. Of all the details I thought out, such as their family structure or what they hate, at least 95% of it stays out of the manga. I can't bring it up. However, I'm unable to create a character unless I put that much thought into them. I had even decided what kind of destiny awaited the regular characters like Alan, Lena Lee, Kamui, the Millennium Earl, the Noah clan, and others before D. Gray Man Star did serialization. These characters were inspired by various people. Some characters were modeled after famous individuals, like Alistair Crowley and Yusuke Santa Maria, and some were based on people she knew, like her editors. There's one more important thing that we haven't discussed yet. The name. Why was the manga called D. Gray Man in the first place, and what does it mean? Well, Gray Man refers to Alan Walker because he is neither a god or an Akuma. The D was an initial that was added onto the title later on in the creative process, because everything starts with the letter D. This may be reference to the English word the, because it sounds like the letter D in Japanese. So D Gray Man could just mean the Gray Man. But it's also possible that the D stands for deer, like you said in the Jump Square Crown video in 2016. So it could also be Deer Gray Man or means something else entirely because Hoshino's never actually given a definitive answer on what the title means. And that may be because there really isn't one, because it's possible that it's just a name that she came up with. No symbolic messages or hidden meanings involved. After finally putting everything together, she submitted a draft to Shonen Jump, where it was promptly rejected at the first editor's meeting. But presumably after a few revisions, the second draft was accepted and they decided to serialize The Gray Man. It was published on May 31st, 2004 in Weekly Shonen Jump. Shuisha also collected the series' chapters and released them in Tankoban volumes, with the first one, Opening, being published on October 4, 2004. The series was a hit, and it sold really well in Japan. Volumes 14, 15, and 16 appeared on the 2008 Top 50 best-selling manga list, and as of August 2020, the series has sold over 25 million copies in circulation in Japan. But despite its overall success, things haven't always gone smoothly for Hoshino, The Gray Man, and its fans. Due to various illnesses and injuries, Katsura Hoshino's series was put on hiatus several times. The first string of hiatuses occurred on November 7, 2005, February 24, 2006, and December 18, 2006. But she recovered, and her work quickly returned to publication. Unfortunately, that wasn't the end of it. It would go on hiatus again on November 16, 2008, and shortly afterwards in May of 2009. When it returned to print on August 17, 2009, it was in a different magazine, Akamaru Jump. This move to Akamaru Jump marked the beginning of an unsettling trend for fans of the manga, shifting between different magazines with different release schedules. Weekly Shonen Jump, where G. Gray Man's chapters were initially published, was, obviously, released on a weekly basis. But Akamaru Jump was a seasonal magazine that ran issues during the Japanese holiday seasons. To the joy of its fans, it didn't stay in Akamaru Jump for very long. But it certainly wasn't the ideal situation for the series. After its short run there, it was moved to Jump Square, or Jump SQ, on November 4th, 2009. The only issue is that Jump Square is a monthly magazine. But hey, at least D. Gray Man was back to a regular publishing schedule. It continued to run in Jump Square until December 29, 2012, when the manga went on another hiatus. This particular the particular hiatus lasts for more than two years, and D. Gray Man didn't return until July 17, 2015. But when it did return, it was under a new magazine, Jump Square Crown, which would be published quarterly. It would remain in Jump Square Crown until the magazine was sunsetted after its final winter issue was released on January 19, 2018. But it didn't stay homeless for long, as it moved to the newly launched Jump Square Rise when it debuted on April 18th of that same year. The series has continued its run in that quarterly magazine ever since, with its latest volume, volume number 27, Red in the Perot, being released in Japan on August 4th, 2020. We're awfully close to present day and we haven't discussed the anime yet, so let's rewind back several years to take a look at D. Gray Man's small screen adaptations. 
Just two years after his debut, in June of 2006, Shuisha announced that D. Gray Man would be adapted into an anime. The series was going to be directed by Asumu Nebishima and produced by several different companies, including Dentsu, TMS Entertainment, Aniplex, and TV Tokyo. TMS Entertainment handled the series' animation, and Aniplex was in charge of music production. It aired on October 3, 2006 on TV Tokyo. It was split into two seasons, or stages. The first stage lasted for 51 episodes, and ran from October 3, 2006 to September 25, 2007. The second stage consisted of 52 episodes, and ran on TV Tokyo from October 2, 2007 to September 30, 2008. Nearly a decade later, at Shuisha's 2016 Jump Festa, a new anime series was announced. Shortly after the announcement, Hoshino stated that, even though it would feature a different staff and cast, the series would serve as a sequel to the original anime, even if there was a good chance that it would be completely different than the original. The new series was titled The Great Man Hollow, and would be directed by Yoshiharu Ashino, and TMS Entertainment would handle the anime's production. It would air on TV Tokyo from July 4th to September 26, 2016, and ran for 13 episodes. While the anime generally follows the source material, there are some key differences between the two, both the original series and in Hollow. The 2006 anime adapts chapter 1, opening, through chapter 157, Recitativo, although it skips most of the first 14 pages. Hollow starts at chapter 151, Rain, and ends at chapter 208, We Live Lives of Doubt, skipping most of pages 22 through 29. The differences between both seasons of the anime and the manga generally fall into these categories. Additional scenes, filler episodes, modified scenes, and removed scenes. D. Greyman is an interesting series with an interesting and tumultuous history. It's been around for nearly two decades and has amassed a loyal following that has stuck by it, even when they may not have been sure that it was ever coming back. Thank you for watching this episode of Anime Spotlight, and if you liked the video, please like the video and subscribe if you like learning about the history of anime. If you know of someone who would find this video interesting, send them the link to this video and tell them to check it out. I'd appreciate it. Have you read or watched D. Greyman before? Or maybe you've never heard of the series before, but now you're interested in giving it a shot. Let me know in the comments, and I'll see you next time.